Good morning, everyone. <clears throat> Welcome to today's lecture, the 12th in the current topic series. It's my great pleasure to introduce to you Dr. Bruce Korf from the University of Alabama at Birmingham. He's the Wayne H. and Sarah Cruz Finley Chair of Medical Genetics, as well as the professor and chair in the Department of Genetics and the director of the Heflin Center for Genomic Sciences. Bruce is an internationally recognized leader in human genetics, and particularly in the study of the neuromuscular, neurodevelop, neurodevelopmental disorder, neurofibromatosis. He served on the board of directors of the American Society of Human Genetics and is past president of both the Association of Professors of Human and Medical Genetics and the American College of Medical Genetics and Genomics. He's currently president of the ACMG Foundation for Genetic and Genomic Medicine. Bruce is very committed to education and mentoring. The fourth edition of his textbook for medical students, Human Genetics and Genomics, was just published last year. He's also the co-author of Medical Genetics at a Glance and is on the editorial board of Current Protocols in Human Genetics. Finally, Bruce has been a long-standing friend of the Genome Institute, having served on our board of scientific counselors for many years. I'm very pleased that Bruce could join us today in sharing his perspectives on genomic medicine. Please join me in welcoming him to the NIH campus. Well, thank you. It's a great pleasure to um, be back here. And um, what I'll try to do in this um, next hour or so is to sort of paint a picture of, at least from my perspective, where things may be going in the world of genomic medicine. Uh, I guess I will show you my financial relationship disclosures. But now let me ask you for this next few minutes to um, engage in a little suspension of disbelief. I'm going to use a kind of um, approach to painting this picture that is um, in some ways kind of real world and in some ways very not real world. Uh, we're going to focus um, on this individual, um, Laura, who as you see has two siblings. and follow her through her life, actually, from birth through advanced age, and speculate, in some cases, with a fair amount of, of experience because things are happening right now and maybe to some extent where things are going, how genomics might be useful in providing guidance to her in terms of health issues. Now, the Suspension of disbelief is going to take the form that as she gets older and older, we're still going to be looking at the way things are done more or less now or now plus perhaps a few years, but not now plus 60 years. I would not even venture to guess what medicine will look like 60 years from now. So you have to realize that as she ages, the snapshot is more or less a contemporary one, maybe today plus a year or two, but probably not much beyond that. You're going to see a lot of pictures in this. Um, these are all pictures that are actually purchased from a company that you can buy pictures from. They're not real patients. It's a real pleasure to completely ignore HIPAA in this context um, because these are paid models. Um, and excuse the fact that these are all um, of a particular ethnic background. I didn't think I could ask you to suspend disbelief to have them change their ethnicity as they grew older. Um, so this is not meant to be any kind of statement about access to genomics or genomic medicine. All right, so with that lengthy preface, we're going to consider these six sort of epics of life. Uh, start in the newborn period. Uh, we'll take a look at, in this case, it's pediatric genomic diagnosis, preconceptional screening as a couple is preparing to start a family prenatal diagnosis, pre-symptomatic testing for risk of disease, and then predispositional testing. All right, so we'll begin the story. Laura is a newborn, and blood is taken from her heel, sent to the state newborn screening laboratory, and her parents are told when the blood is drawn, they see the Band-Aid maybe, and they're told it's a routine test not to worry about it. They don't. They never hear again about it, and in this case, no news indeed is good news. So as you imagine are aware, everybody born in the U.S. throughout more or less the developed world will have a heel stick done in the 
early days of life, and these days, but still put on a little card, these days it tends to go most times in the U.S. to a state laboratory, and tandem mass spectrometry is the most typical technology used for most of the tests. Uh, without going into any technical details, the sample goes in one end and a spectrum comes out the other, and it can be used to identify analytes that are present in the blood that signal any of a few dozen at this point inborn errors of metabolism. And the theory behind this, which was developed in the 1960s, and the paradigm was in phenylketonuria, PKU, that if you wait for the onset of signs or symptoms, because of, in that case, high phenylalanine in the blood, which damages the nervous system progressively, if you wait for that to begin to occur, those, that damage is irreversible. On the other hand, if you can make the diagnosis at birth, and for most of these metabolic disorders, the placenta clears the toxic substance that you can't handle because of an enzyme deficiency. So until you're born, there's no accumulation. But the clock starts when you have your first feed. These toxic substances, toxic to you, will build up and progressively damage nervous system and other tissues for that matter as well. Well, if you can figure that out, before the process has gone to any extent, these are treatable, usually by manipulation of the diet, in the case of PKU, a special formula deficient in phenylalanine. And there are now a couple of dozen, three or so dozen uh, metabolic disorders that can be diagnosed this way because they can be treated, usually with diet, occasionally with vitamin supplementation, increasingly now with targeted medications even. But the point is, this is a huge public health triumph that dates back into the early 1960s and is now routine. And there's a more or less standardized list of conditions that are screened for. American College of Medical Genetics and Genomics actually uh, took the lead in defining the kind of panel that would be used around the U.S. Well, the question now is on the table whether this would be better done through a genomic approach rather than the tandem mass spectrometry kind of approach that I just described. And in fact, this was actually a paper published a couple of years ago. It really wasn't focused specifically on newborn screening. In fact, it really was asking whether it would be efficient to use a, a genomic sequencing approach to diagnose 450 or so in, um, metabolic and other neurodegenerative disorders. Uh, but the point that was made in this um, was a significant proportion of annotated so-called disease-causing variants that were not, in fact, disease-causing at all. And it raises the point that as genomics are increasingly used in diagnostics, and if they were to be used in newborn screening, we need to cope with the fact that you're going to find a lot of things you're not quite sure what they mean. And there are some unfortunate, even egregious examples in the literature where somebody published a case report 30 years ago attributing a particular mutation to a particular phenotype. It got forgotten. Now, years past, you find that mutation, you read about it and say, well, this is the phenotype, but it doesn't really fit with the patient. And then you go back and you find out that the author had figured out eventually this was just a benign variant that they hadn't realized was that at the time they reported it, and it never got re-reported or corrected in the literature. And the literature is littered with these misannotations, which is the subject of a lot of effort now uh, to try to have a much more um, well-curated database, which is going to be increasingly critical as genomic approaches are used in diagnostics. But it is a caveat in terms of newborn screening. You're probably aware that NHGRI is um, a sponsor of a set of um, grants that were issued over this past year or so, I think there are four if I recall, um, that are actually looking at the question, I think together with NICHD, of the utility of a genomic approach to newborn screening to define the sort of paradigm by which that might occur. And among the issues are things such as how do you know that a particular variant is pathogenic, and also um, how do you deal with a point that we'll come back to in a few minutes, uh, which is the inevitable finding of so-called incidental findings that 
are not necessarily the target of what you're trying to diagnose in the newborn, but nevertheless uh, may be important to the health of the individual as they get older. And that's a point, as I say, we'll return to. All right, so from newborn screening, let's now move into the world of diagnosis. So Laura is now three, and she has a brother, Seth, a couple of years older, and he's been experiencing developmental problems and ultimately is diagnosed as having autism or autism spectrum disorder. You know, a lot of people have asked in the past few years, you know, when is genomics actually going to hit sort of real-time medicine? Um, there's been, I think, this perception that there was a lot of hope, but how much of it's really making a difference. I guess I would argue that one of the first and most significant advances that has certainly changed the world of medical genetics is the area of cytogenomics, um, which is depicted in this diagram here to the left. So until a few years ago, the approach to looking at chromosomes, which geneticists will tell you, by the way, they've been genomicists for 50 years because when you look at the human karyotype, you are taking, I guess it's the ultimate bird's eye view of the human genome. Um, I often tell patients it's like taking a picture of the Earth from a satellite 25,000 miles up. And you can see volcanoes and you can see other very significant disruptions maybe. Um, and that's about the level of resolution that we had from about 1959 until fairly recently. Uh, that you could see trisomies like trisomy 21 associated with Down syndrome. You could see translocations, big deletions that were large enough to be visible with the light microscope. And then in the 1980s into the 90s, fluorescence in situ hybridization came along, permitting you to light up a particular region of a chromosome. But you had to know in advance where to look. You had to have a phenotype that correlated with a particular genetic change, and if you knew that, you could often verify it at the molecular level. However, you often couldn't make a diagnosis because you didn't know in advance where to look, and the level of change was too subtle to be visible with the light microscope. And you might have been able to use fish if you had known which probe to use, but you often didn't. Well, the cytogenomic technology, I won't go into detail about it from a technical perspective. It's done by various approaches, comparative genomic hybridization, taking a patient sample, a reference sample, having different color fluorescence for each, then allowing them to compete for hybridization on a chip that contains oligonucleotides from across the genome would be a commonly used approach. And these are the kind of readouts you get. And way down here may be visible is a shift of this curve. Everything on this zero line, which you can't really read probably, is essentially normal. There's a little bit of noise to either side, but way down here is a region which is shifted to the left and reflects a deletion that would simply never have been seen with the light microscope. It might be verifiable by fish, but there would have been no a priori reason to look there, and therefore it would have for sure been missed. And I can tell you in our lab, and I think this is pretty typical in most, if you looked at individuals with undefined, so to speak, intellectual disability, so intellectual problems without other clues to help you make a diagnosis, the cytogenetic pickup rate, that or autism spectrum disorder, was maybe 5 percent. And now the pickup rate with this cytogenomic, as it's been described, approach is pushing 15 to 20 percent. Now, you know, it's not 100 percent. And there's hence uh, significant gaps in our ability, but it has made a big difference. And actually, you know, there's, there's a debate now that um, unfortunately has uh, mostly occurred in the world of um, insurance as to reimbursability of, of tests like this. I probably return to this point a little later in another context, uh, which is how much difference does it make? What's, you know, what, how are you making somebody better by establishing that they have a tiny deletion at this part? the chromosome. You can't treat them differently because of it. Maybe someday we will if we knew what particular genes were relevant to this region and maybe there would be some kind of intervention that would be effective. But honestly, we're a ways off from that. I think in most instances the benefit is, well, partly 
to provide a kind of peace of mind to the family. It avoids the need to do lots of other testing that you might have otherwise done to try to establish a diagnosis and provides a basis for genetic counseling and recurrence risk assessment. So these are, I think, to a geneticist, significant benefits. The insurance industry, I think, is moving in um, this direction, at least in our state. I think the willingness to reimburse this is actually improving, and I see that as a positive sign, but it has really been a kind of an uphill battle um, over these past several years. So this is the, the kind of experience you hear about pretty commonly, the so-called diagnostic odyssey that um, is, you know, if you start here, you have a clinical problem, you establish a differential diagnosis as well as you can, you might do genetic testing, it gets interpreted, no, that's not the correct gene is often the outcome, and you try again, and you keep going in circles, and each turn of the cycle could cost, depending on the test, even a couple of thousand dollars, perhaps, sometimes less, sometimes more. It takes time, sometimes measured in many months, even a year or more, and as time passes, families get increasingly frustrated because they often are motivated to establish a diagnosis and find that that's quite elusive. And so this kind of idea, first of all, of cytogenomics and now more recently of exome sequencing has been sort of posited as an approach. This is a screenshot of a paper published in the New England Journal just in the last few months, I guess October of last year, um, that reports a 25% rate of diagnosis of single gene, basically, changes that are believed to be clinically significant, um, which presumably is on top of whatever might have been detected by cytogenomics. So it really begins to sort of um, push up the rate of diagnosis. It's not an inexpensive test on its own. On the other hand, it doesn't take too many turns of the cycle in the context of ordinary testing before you spent more than the cost of an exome sequence. And the truth is, actually, it doesn't take many MRI scans, especially in a child who needs anesthesia, to similarly um, rack up a bill that will exceed the cost of exome sequencing. Well, one of the things that has occurred, that you probably have heard some about, in this um, recent year or two, is the debate surrounding incidental findings. The exome sequence does not target, obviously, a particular gene of interest. It is looking pretty well everywhere, close to everywhere, not every exon, as I'm sure you know, but nevertheless, a pretty broad search of the genome, and therefore has the potential of picking things up that are not the target in terms of the diagnosis you were seeking, but nevertheless may be important for the health of an individual. I, I pulled this picture um, because it depicts what I sort of conceptualized to be the scenario, um, which is guy, in this case, the passerby was too late, hit on the head with a flower pot as he's walking. As a passerby, would you feel an obligation if you saw the flower pot teetering on the ledge to warn the individual of this impending potential disaster? And I think most of us would say that we would, I would hope, especially if I were the passerby. But nevertheless, um, the question is, you know, what is the obligation of the genomics laboratory or the ordering clinician to report significant incidental findings that occur in the context of genomic sequencing. Well, the ACMG took this on about a year ago. Actually, Les Biesecker from this institute was one of the lead authors and um, co-chair of the committee with Robert Green. Uh, this is the publication that appeared in Genetics and Medicine. Um, it sort of, you know, be careful what you wish for. Um, I think the genetics community has always wanted to have um, some stories that would, at least the, the medical genetics community, that would show up on the front page of major newspapers. This one did, um, but it generated a lot of controversy. These are the kind of distilled recommendations. Um, mutations on a minimum list should be reported by the laboratory regardless of patient age, even for children, in spite of perhaps a condition that might be adult onset that they should report variants on a list I'll show you in a minute. The ordering clinician would be responsible for the pre- and post-test counseling. 
that was actually, these three bullets were all I showed until about two months ago or something like that. Uh, at the ACMG meeting that occurred in March, this additional point was added. The board of directors voted that patients should be able to opt out of having analysis of incidental findings, which was recognizing a, a pretty significant controversy that had evolved. So here's the list of genes. And by the way, there's a committee of ACMG working now, and I think probably on an ongoing basis, realizing that this list is a moving target. But anyway, here's, I won't read the list, but I will show you the kind of concept here. Um, so there are some tumor predisposition syndromes, which is the largest list. The poster case are the two um, BRCA um, genes that um, are associated with hereditary breast and ovarian cancer. Um, some connective tissue disorders, cardiomyopathies, um, disorders associated with arrhythmia, hypercholesterolemia, and malignant hyperthermia. So what it took to get on the list was, first of all, you had to have a condition that might not have been diagnosed clinically. So if it was an obvious clinical phenotype, it wasn't on the list if the assumption was you should have already been diagnosed. So if you carry a BRCA mutation, you don't look any different from anybody else. You hope that you'll realize that you carry this mutation before you develop cancer, which would be the kind of sign that this is a condition that you're at risk for. It also had to be a condition where there was a well-established natural history where we had a pretty good idea of what the particular pathogenicity of, of variants was, so this can't be uh, reporting variants of unknown significance. And there had to be something you could do if you f were found to carry this mutation. You had to have an action, which, again, this is the easiest one to describe because it's pretty familiar. There's a lot of opportunities to intervene to reduce the risk of cancer in a person who's a BRCA1 or 2 carrier, in whether it's surgery, um, surveillance, chemo prevention. Um, there's very well-established paradigms now. So the thinking was that if you come from a small family, maybe, or you're adopted, perhaps, you don't have any knowledge of your family history, you would only figure out that you were at risk of breast and ovarian cancer by virtue of carrying this gene the day you developed one of those cancers. And wouldn't it be better if you knew this long before the fact? And here, there is real intervention that could be offered. And the thinking was, if you happened on this result, even if it was a child, and ACMG does not recommend testing children for adult onset disorders, but the thinking was, well, even if you're a child, you might ever otherwise never know that this risk occurred until maybe your mother developed breast cancer at some point. And because of that, the ACMG did recommend that this gene or these genes be scrutinized even in a child because of the benefit it would have to the family and indirectly to the child to have a parent who survives long enough uh, to provide care as the child gets older. So that was the rationale. Um, ultimately, there was a lot of hue and cry about undermining patient autonomy and a lot of debate about the point. Um, ultimately, it was decided to offer people a, a possibility of opting out. So that's the recommendation. The experience of labs anecdotally has been very, very few people do opt out, but there are some, and so be it. That, um, there's a small proportion who just don't want to know, in spite of the medical actionability of these things. These were not genes where you learn the name of the thing you're someday going to get and can't do anything about it. Anyway, uh, enough said about this, but it's, it's an example, and I'm sure there'll be others, of ethical issues that arise as we have new tools that um, really, in many ways, change the medical paradigm. All right, what about preconceptional screening? So now Laura's married. She and her husband are considering starting a family. They meet with their OBGYN. They're of Northern European ancestry, and among the things offered to them is carrier screening for cystic fibrosis. This has um, been practiced over this last um, maybe, what, 15 years. In the late 90s, there was a consensus conference at the NIH recommended that all couples be offered a panel of tests for the common CF mutations that comprise um, the frequencies of 1% or greater of the CF mutations. And um, this, therefore, permits couples to learn that they're both carriers, therefore, at risk and to then 
incorporate that into their family planning. Otherwise, couples only usually learn of their risk after their first child is born, and sometimes they don't even figure that out until more than one child is born because it takes them a while sometimes for the diagnosis to be made. So ethnicity-based screening has been practiced, certainly in the US, for a long time. The most common are for individuals of Ashkenazi Jewish descent. This is a partial list. I think a commonly used list now is about 19 conditions that are due to founder effects in that population that lead to a relatively high frequency of being a carrier for these generally devastating conditions. Um, individuals at risk of various hemoglobinopathies and then um, pan-ethnic screening car carried out for CF and now also for spinal muscular atrophy. Well, what about doing this at a genomic level? And there are companies now that are beginning to do just this. Well, I'll quote the same paper I quoted a few minutes ago, um, a few years back, and show you a different um, slide pulled from their paper. And this is um, for the 400 and some conditions they looked at. So this is not looking across the whole genome. How often did they find an ind individual to be a carrier for one of those? And there were a few individuals who had no um, mutation for any of these genes, but indeed it was very few. The majority, I guess the, the kind of um, mode here um, was to have be a carrier for three different conditions. You see some people were carriers for many more. I think it's a fair statement if you look across the entire genome that we are all carriers for something, that if our partner happens to be a carrier for the same thing would have implications for our offspring. And we're finding more and more that couples are interested in a sort of pan-ethnic screen. I think a lot of people are not clear on their ethnicity these days. The information may not be so obvious to them, and hence going back a few generations may be difficult. Um, and the thinking is even for very rare conditions that you know, it wouldn't be practical in a kind of enzyme-based um, system or even a one gene at a time system to test for all of those. But on the other hand, now the incremental cost of adding another you know, mutation to a screen is so close to zero that even if it's an exceeding rare, exceedingly rare disorder, why should couples not have at least the information to use for their decision making if in fact they are at risk? Because obviously some are. That's how those conditions happen does raise an interesting question. If the carrier burden, if you want to think of it that way, is that high, everybody is going to be found to be a carrier for something and probably want to have a conversation about it. And it raises an issue in terms of manpower or person power um, to offer the counseling that needs to accompany this. And I'll return to that at the end. But what about prenatal testing? So in fact, they are CF carriers, and they like to have a prenatal diagnosis. It's done by amniocentesis, and indeed, the child is found to be a carrier but not to be affected. So prenatal diagnostic approaches have been used now for many, many years. Amniocentesis is the kind of initial paradigm. Chorionic villus sampling, this is shown transcervically. It can also be done transabdominally. Offers a somewhat earlier diagnosis. Many couples are opting for pre-implantation testing where you would do in vitro fertilization of multiple eggs, carry them typically to about the eighth cell stage, biopsy a single blastomere, and test it for the condition for which that couple is at risk, and implant those embryos back into the mother not found to carry the mutation. A not inexpensive approach, but one that many couples find sort of attractive as an alternative. Well, for a long time, there has been a kind of selective screening. Um, in the early days, it was on the basis of maternal age, knowing that there is an increased risk of trisomy, especially trisomy 21, associated with Down syndrome. Over the years, it's evolved into a combination of ultrasound and various biochemical measures. Uh, but what about the possibility of doing this using a genomic approach? And in this past few years, that has really seen the light of day using cell-free DNA that is circulating in mother's circulation, um, and a proportion of that is of fetal origin, I think from trophoblast cells mainly. And if one does sequencing of the DNA that is 
found in the mother's blood, of course, most of it's maternal, but enough of it is fetal, that you can quantify the proportion of chromosomes, in this case, um, 13, 18, and 21. These are the three associated with live-born trisomy syndromes, and can show that in each of these trisomies, there's a substantial increased representation of sequences from the relevant chromosomes. This chart pulled from a paper on this topic. There's been a lot of literature on it now, um, demonstrations of clinical utility. It's increasingly um, used. There are a variety of companies that are offering it, and very possibly it will move to a sort of hospital-based test at some point. Uh, but increasingly, this is a genomic test that is in re routine use. Could you sequence the fetal genome from this cell-free DNA? The answer is you can, not a trivial process. Um, this particular um, exercise required essentially um, sequencing the parental genomes and the fetal genome, and you can infer the um, fetal genome from a combination of the data that you get from all of that. Um, it was used as a kind of proof of principle of the idea of doing a genome sequence prenatally and, you know, raises all, you know, the incidental finding questions only become more complicated when you think of it from a prenatal diagnostic perspective, realizing usually the target is some immediately medically significant phenotype, not a phenotype that would be delayed by decades, but at least in principle this can happen and if it reaches a point where it does any substantial degree, it's going to raise some really interesting questions about how to handle the incidental findings. I actually um, participated in a um, perspective in the New England Journal a few months ago. A couple of colleagues um, who are bioethicists asked if I would work with them mainly to add a medical genetic perspective. Um, and so the, the concept here was not whether it would be a good thing for people to do sequencing of a prenatal genome, but rather whether parents who want to do it should be permitted to do it. And the argument here is essentially a, a kind of autonomy-based argument that uh, they should be. Parents typically make decisions on behalf of their either fetus or their child. Um, I expected a, a, another firestorm from this. It didn't seem to take place, though. Um, either means it was ignored or people agreed with it. All right, so what about pre-symptomatic testing. So now Laura is 45. She's learned that she has a sister who is a few years older, diagnosed now with breast cancer, and that raises the concern about the risk that might apply to other members of the family. This is not their family. It actually is a kind of um, pedigree that uh, we have seen in our own clinic. Uh, the proband may not be easy to see here, um, is this individual, and she came to attention or came to clinic because her sister, who is still alive, has breast cancer, and you see there is also a paternal aunt with breast cancer, a cousin, a grandparent, and then there's a uncle with prostate cancer and another aunt who died of ovarian cancer. There's cancer on both sides of the family, actually, um, these two individuals. Um, cancer is not rare. And everybody has a family history of some kind of cancer. But this was enough family history to raise concern about whether there was a genetic predisposition. We actually organized to do testing of the sister first. And this is a paradigm that is not that uncommon in genetics, but is a little bit unusual in medicine, which is the person that comes to clinic isn't the person you recommend first be tested. And the rationale here is that if this family history is accounted for by a mutation, then the most likely person who would carry one is an affected individual. So if we had tested our patient first and she had be, um, come back negative, we wouldn't know if that negative test was because she didn't inherit a gene mutation that is in the family, or if this family history was accounted for by some other risk factor besides a mutation in the various um, BRCA genes. By testing the sister and proving she actually did carry a mutation, we were able then to test our patient, and she indeed turned out to be negative. And that was very reassuring because there was no issue about whether either some other gene was involved or some undetectable mutation in, the, in either of these genes might be involved. So we could tell her 
that this family history was not relevant to her anymore, that we can account for it, and she didn't inherit that risk factor. And therefore, it was quite a useful thing. I alluded to this earlier, but I think it's, it bears emphasizing that this is an example of a medically actionable genetic diagnosis. Because you know, in the early days, which is in the, what, I guess, mid-90s, when these genes were discovered, it was a huge sort of um, accomplishment. And it offered insights into the pathophysiology of breast and ovarian cancer. So it really was a landmark. And very soon, it became obvious you could offer testing. And many families were interested in doing it. But there was a lot of debate about whether you were doing them a favor. I mean, part of the concern was you could tell them that they were at risk. You might not be quite sure exactly what the magnitude of the risk was, because data sets were perhaps, for one thing, not that many. And secondly, they were biased, probably, because the families that had been studied were families that had a fairly high penetrance. And the question is, is that typical? And there wasn't good data to show that the prophylactic approaches, surgery, chemo prevention, surveillance were effective, because there wasn't really enough time to know that a cohort had been followed where you had done these things and could demonstrate benefit. There was some sort of common sense benefit, surgery, a fairly extreme approach. If the target tissue has been removed, at least you believe mostly removed, um, it should reduce the risk. But that hadn't been proven. And there was concern that there might be residual tissue. This was a paper published a few years back um, showing the benefit of salpingo ophorectomy um, in individuals who are carriers of mutations. And you can see, compared to surveillance, as these pots go down, that means more people get cancer. Uh, so there is a substantial protective effect. And I think this is really pretty standard in the field right now. I don't think anybody would argue that doing this test is of academic interest only, or that it just tells you something that you can't do anything about. You may or may not choose to do all the things you could do, but you at least have choices before you. And I can tell you in our center, we have a very substantial demand I think in most centers um, that offer this, there's typically a backlog even of people interested in, uh, in being assessed. Sometimes because they're self-referred, because of concern about family history or young age of onset of cancer, other times referred by either primary care doctors or community doctors, but nevertheless, um, substantial demand. And by the way, the outcome of evaluation is not always testing. Sometimes it's the opposite. We often see people whose risk based on family history isn't as high as they think it is. And we can reassure them. So not everybody who comes through gets tested. And the testing landscape, as you probably know, has really evolved in the last year or so. Um, the company that owned the patent on these genes, that's been overturned. There's still some legal stuff going on. But there are other companies now that are offering it. So it's a fairly available test. Genetic testing has increasingly informed therapeutics, not just diagnostics. I won't walk you through every image here. They're, I realize, too small to see. Uh, most people view the story of imatinib as a kind of poster case of designing a drug um, that is a tar it targets a particular genetic change, originally in chronic myelogenous leukemia, the BCR able oncogene and has made a very big difference in the treatment of that condition and actually others as well um, that respond to imatinib. Um, this is showing the HER2 new amplification that occurs in breast cancer for which there are specific drugs. This is unreadable, but it shows a um, BRAF mutation in melanoma that also is relevant. And so this concept of tailoring a drug to a particular diagnosis, which we hear a lot about, has already become a reality, at least in the world of oncology. And I think there are increasingly uh, many instances where genome sequencing is being applied to particular cancers. You get these kind of dramatic pictures. You can create lists of genes that are mutated, and in some cases, use that as a basis for therapeutic decision making. What's depicted over here is a kind of different paradigm, namely that of pharmacogenetics, um, the idea that individuals metabolize drugs or respond to drugs in individual ways on the basis of genotypic differences that mostly have to do with the 
polymorphisms in metabolic enzymes or in particular targets of these drugs. And this is showing the um, excretion of or the targeting of warfarin, very commonly used blood thinner, with a very narrow therapeutic window. You give too much and the person's at risk of hemorrhage. You give too little and the outcome is they haven't been adequately protected against coagulation. I don't think anybody really debates whether this is an effective way of predicting the optimal dose for a particular individual. There is, however, a fair amount of debate as to whether it can be done in a timely way since the decision to anticoagulate needs sometimes to be made very quickly and ultimately whether it's cost effective, whether you actually improve outcomes over a kind of long haul and can justify the cost of testing. Although, as the cost of testing goes down and maybe asymptotically approaches zero, as more and more genomic testing is done, it may shift that equation. And there's a lot of work ongoing uh, to try to demonstrate clinical utility. So clinical validity, does this test predict a particular response to this drug, is pretty good. Clinical utility is the area that has been mostly debated. Something that I'm not sure I would have predicted as a medical geneticist, but has been a particularly exciting area, is that a lot of the conditions that we kind of grew up thinking of as not really treatable have evolved to be, in fact, quite treatable. Uh, I wouldn't argue that CF would be a case in point of not treatable, because there had been lots of treatments offered, um, chest PT, antibiotic use, things to thin mucus. So it's not that it wasn't treatable, and a lot of progress has been made over the years in improving outcomes. But, you know, the fundamental problem is this chloride channel that is ultimately put together in the Golgi finds its way to the cell membrane, uh, which is mutated, either is degraded in the proteasome in some instances of mutation, or it gets to the membrane but just doesn't work. And so it's generated the interest in either so-called potentiators that would restore function to a mutated protein or correctors that would resurrect the or prevent the destruction, I guess is a better word, of the mutant protein. And there is now an FDA-approved drug, Ivacaftor, um, which targets a very specific mutation, this G551D mutation, and does function as a potentiator. And so this is the um, forced expiratory volume, a measure of pulmonary function in individuals treated versus placebo, a very substantial improvement was seen um, fairly quickly and now, as I said, is an FDA-approved drug. And this concept of defining the mutation and searching for a small molecule that restores function to the protein, or potentially there are other approaches that will restore function to the gene, is an area of research that certainly is um, one that couldn't have been imagined before the era of genetic and now genomic testing. And this, plus other small molecule approaches, once you understand pathophysiology, you heard my interest is in neurofibromatosis. Uh, we have right now multiple clinical trials ongoing for a condition that when I started seeing patients 30 odd years ago with NF1, all we could do is make a diagnosis and send people to surgery. Now we can offer, well, I can't say we can offer definitive treatments, but we can enroll people in clinical trials using medications that target the particular pathophysiology of their condition. And that is a huge, huge step forward. All right, finally, what about predispositional testing? So Laura's now 60 and she's been well, but then she and her husband have heard that there's the possibility of doing genomic testing and they go on the internet, or whatever the internet looks like in 60 years, and um, they look at what testing can be done. You know, the paradigm here is we're all born with a genetic liability of some sort. Sometimes it's overwhelming, and that's how you wind up with neurofibromatosis or cystic fibrosis or something. But in most of us, it's not. However, over the course of time and the exposure to environmental factors, you sort of cross from a so-called pre-symptomatic to a disease state. And the question is, if we knew what those risk factors were, Maybe we could help avoid some of these environmental effects or whatever else drives the progression towards disease. Or if you did cross this line, find better treatments than currently exist. So that's, I think, what pushes a lot of the 
efforts to find genetic factors that are associated with common disease. And you all know well here uh, some of the progress that has been made. Let me just make a comment about um, some of the clinical applications. And so here's a screenshot, which is increasingly um, becoming historical, of um, the concept of direct-to-consumer testing. This was taken a few years ago now, um, and these three companies um, were offering this testing. Um, this one and this one, as best I know, are completely out of the business. This one has been more or less, um, well, not shut down, but the FDA has um, now put a stop on their reporting any clinical interpretations, um, at least pending their satisfying the FDA uh, that they're compliant with um, the FDA rules on, on medical testing. Um, well, I'll tell you, so I actually did this before that happened, and so therefore I did get this information, and I'll tell you, remind you actually, that I did not need to do any financial disclosure of this because I paid for this. Um, the paradigm here is that you go online, you give them your credit card number, which I did. Um, they send you a tube to spit into up to a line, which is not as easy as it sounds, by the way. Um, you mail it back to them. It's barcoded, so it's associated with you. And then you get an email that says, well, sort of like your genome is ready. Of course, it's not your genome yet, anyway. It's like a million SNPs that they genotype. And you get this kind of thing, at least I got this kind of thing. If you were to um, do this today, I don't think you would, although anybody who had done it before the FDA clamped down still can see this stuff. So this is showing my risk of type 2 diabetes. And they give these pretty graphic ways of showing it. And you see my risk was about the same as the population risk. Um, that's actually fundamentally what I learned from this, that I was at average risk for everything you've ever heard of, and I kind of decided that was okay. There's been a lot of concern in the medical community about um, this, or at least in some parts of the medical community, the idea that, well, all right, so you're at average risk. What happens if you're found to be at low risk? Does that mean that you would ignore the advice that you should lose weight and exercise more, which, by the way, is the advice given for every single medical condition, practically? Um, that you'll see on this. But that kind of cynical interpretation aside, the con concern might be somebody would attribute more significance to these results than they really deserve because although there's a lot of actually pretty good quality um, information about the interpretation of this, who's going to read the fine print and perhaps not realize that, first of all, the degree of heritability is limited and the contribution of the various markers they're looking at towards that her heritability is even further limited. And who knows if the data comes from a population that resembles your background and whether those are accurate or not. So there's a lot of caveats here, and they're all in there, but whether everybody will see them is another matter. Uh, so there's been a fair amount of concern about clinical utility, once again, and even clinical validity in this case. By the way, you get other stuff that's kind of interesting. You learn about um, for example, can you smell asparagus in your urine, which is a genetic polymorphism? And some of you know what I'm talking about, and some of you have no idea. Um, but, you know, it's, some people call it recreational genomics, and it sort of is. It's worth a few minutes of cocktail party conversation, not too many. Um, you also learn about ancestry, and then you have the option of turning on a function that allows others with the same haplotypes on their Y chromosome or mitochondria to contact you. I left that on for a few minutes. My email box started getting deluged with, you might be my relative. And I decided it wasn't too productive because most of these, if they were related, it was so many generations back, I wasn't sure what to do with it. Anyhow, uh, you also do get um, pharmacogenetic data. I'll show you in a minute. But before, let me just point out this study done a few years ago where five individuals sent their samples to two companies when there were two companies that you could send them to. And if the arrows point in the same direction, it means they got concordant results. But if they point in opposite directions, and you know, notice there are many examples where that is the case, they got discordant results. Why? Not because they disagreed about what the genotypes were. They generally did agree, so the, the analytic validity was very high. It was usually because different algorithms were used to calculate risk based on different combinations of markers and other in information that they might have incorporated into the risk figure. So it is, or at least was, very much a kind of buyer beware um, scenario. 
Now, this is the pharmacogenetic data you get. This is mine. I'm at increased sensitivity to warfarin. I, I, tell the, I show this slide anywhere I, I can where there might be physicians in the audience because I figure if I'm ever in a situation where I need to be administered warfarin, I don't want to be the only one that knows that I'm at increased risk, right? So, in fact, I gave my primary care doctor a printout of this, and I got the predicted response, which is, what am I supposed to do with this? And I actually know what he did with it. It was, it was put in a pile, and I suspect nothing happened with it after that. But if it, anything did, it was then maybe scanned into the medical record, which is pretty close to useless because it would be buried in there. It's not flagged as being anything that would be important to know about, like to an emergency room doctor, which might be the context where the actual prescription would actually be written. And so there's a systems issue, which is not unique to our health system. I think it's a pretty common one, which is this is data that here it is. It doesn't cost anything, and it could in principle be used. It is a CLIA-approved lab, by the way, and yet it's going to get buried at best and therefore not available, and why not use it? I, mean, I would like to know. I don't you know, if I ever got warfarin and I was at increased risk of hemorrhage, um, having trained as a neurologist and seeing people with hemorrhages after falling when they were on warfarin, it, it's not a good thing. So anyway, I think we're a ways away from having not so much the data as the systems to incorporate pharmacogenetic information into day-to-day -day care. All right, so in the last few minutes, let me just make some comments about kind of where all this may be going. You often hear the metaphor of the genome as the book of life. I prefer to think of it as the library of life because if you conceptualize any one gene as a book, the genome is really the collection of all of these. Now put yourself in the shoes of a non-geneticist, a primary care doctor, say, or somebody, you know, a specialist outside the realm of genetics, and this is what you're faced with. And you could think back, if you like, to your medical school or wherever you learn this, and you might remember that the genetic code is a three-letter code. And so you could say to yourself, so what's an example of a book that uses three-letter words? And here's one that comes to mind. And so it's possible to come to the conclusion, how hard could this be? Fairly simple code. And I guess my perception is that if you are going to use a literary metaphor for the genome, a better one is this book. I think you could probably get a first grader or second grader to read Ulysses, if you mean by that to read the words, but I doubt too many of them would have any idea what the book is about. It's notoriously challenging to read. You have to have, first of all, sophisticated knowledge of the meaning of words. You have to read between the lines, see hidden meanings that are sometimes very obscure. And I think the genome actually behaves much more like Ulysses than it does the cat in the hat. And if you want to strain a literary metaphor one more bit, um, it doesn't take long to go through the looking glass where the rules you thought applied as to how genes are expressed when they're turned on, when they're turned off, the role of epigenetics, a lot of the rules are much more subtle than what might have been previously appreciated. So how will the kind of average non-genetics physician use genetics and genomics? Tell you this quick story. This is um, one that happened in our clinic. We saw this child um, who was 18 months old, uh, and it, there's a family history in this child's um, through this child's mother of multiple endocrine neoplasia with these various tumors that individuals in the family are at risk for. And this child actually presented with diarrhea, which arguably could be a, a GI tumor symptom. It was a pretty young child to have that kind of tumor, but anyway, um, that was the possibility. And the endocrinologist it was who saw him sent a genetic test and went out to a lab that does testing for this disorder, and they found a variant of unknown significance. This is a kind of my depiction they had at the one end of the spectrum, whether it was pathogenic, and the other end it was benign, and somehow they could tell you it was right smack in the middle. Um, and so it was not clear whether it was truly pathogenic. However, 
the child got labeled in the record as having multiple endocrine neoplasia based on this finding. And that's actually a frighteningly common occurrence. I see a lot of neurofibromatosis patients, as you've heard. Happens our lab does a lot of NF testing. Recently, I saw somebody where our lab had done a test when this child lived in California, actually, found a variant of unknown significance, had lots of instructions on what to do next to try to validate it, looking to see if it segregates in the family, for example, none of which was done. The referring doctor labeled the child as having NF. They moved, as it happens, to the um, southeast. We saw them in clinic. This is not a child I would have diagnosed with NF, had some cafe au lait spots, but nothing else. And lo and behold, it turned out had a different condition that causes cafe au lait spots. Again, misinterpreting a variant of unknown significance. Back to this story. All right, so that's what this child was found to have. Well, the mother then came to attention separately and was sent actually to genetics clinic for testing by an adult endocrinologist. Testing was sent to a different lab and a known pathogenic mutation was found. That is to say, one that had been well described in the literature and was clearly pathogenic. Whoops. And uh, I'll just tell you, from here, um, it turned out, oops, from here it turned out that when we tested this child again, he did not have his mother's pathogenic mutation. And so this whole thing was a complete red herring, and he does not have that condition. And by the way, his diarrhea resolved. It was a, just a gastroenteritis when all was said and done. So it's an example where if you kind of take the perspective of this child's physician, they knew enough to know that there was an inheritance pattern here and that the child was at risk, 50% risk, in fact. They knew enough to know that there was genetic testing and even to send it, but stumbled when it came to interpreting it. So actually, this was the next thing I was going to show you, um, which this issue of how do you train non-geneticists to appropriately use genetic and genomic tests has been the subject now of an initiative that NHGRI has um, spearheaded, the Inner Society Coordinating Committee, which is a group of professional societies representing many different specialties that have been convened now on multiple occasions to try to coordinate efforts to educate their various constituencies about genetics and genomics. And um, a working group um, that I was involved in um, tried to set up, did set up a framework for competencies that we felt could be used by different groups to define the competencies in genetics and genomics that would be appropriate for particular specialties, realizing they're quite different from one specialty to another. So this is a work in progress. This recently was published, and our hope is to partner with these different specialties now to try to help them actually to achieve this. All right, so let me end with some speculation about Will a day come when everybody has their genome sequenced? Lots of people talk about it, and it probably, if it doesn't happen, it won't be because it costs too much. I think you're all aware of how quickly the price is coming down. I could believe it will intersect the x-axis by um, at some point in time, or come pretty close to doing that. It'll become so cheap, it'll be hard to put a number on it. I used to say that we'll have, you know, back when the $1,000 genome was the holy grail, that we'd have a $1,000 genome, but a million-dollar interpretation. And I think that's even not proving to be true now, as, as improvements are being made in the informatics approaches. But you could ask the question, when in life would you want to be sequenced, and where would the information live? It could be done prenatally. We spoke about that before. Lots of opportunity to intervene, but then lots of questions as to whether you want to know some of the things that you could know before a child is born. We talked about newborn screening. Some of the same issues come up, but as you heard, it's being tested. Could be done in children, at least then there's still a possibility of intervention for early onset conditions. Or you could wait until a person is old enough to give informed consent, which is probably ideal, except for the fact that they've already kind of foreclosed some possibilities of intervention, perhaps, uh, that apply to some earlier onset conditions. You could ask, where would the information live? In the electronic health records? Any of you who have worked with one will 
I'm sure, laugh at the notion because they can barely store um, ordinary clinical information and would they be the right place to store genomic information? Hard to know. I will say, however, even if they could, and even if they do, they're not particularly good at talking to each other. So if you have your information in one health system, what's going to ensure that it will be available to the next one? If you're traveling, or for that matter, hardly anybody, I would guess, these days is born, lives, and dies associated with just one health institution. Uh, people do move around a lot, and is it, gonna, is it really practical to keep it in one place? Maybe it could be stored in the cloud. I'm sure some already do that. It does raise issues of trust and privacy, but maybe those are surmountable. You can load it on a personal device as long as you don't lose it or put it in the washing machine. It'll be there. This is my favorite. The most efficient place to store genetic information appears to be the cell nucleus, and nobody ever forgets to bring their cell nuclei to the doctor. So I, I actually could find it possible to imagine the day will come when it'll be cheaper to just resequence you, you know, while you're in the waiting room, waiting to be seen, use whatever is going to be used that day, and then throw it away because it'll be easier to have it done again than to bother storing it anywhere. I'm not sure. Obviously, that that'll be the case, but it, I think at least is a possibility. But the question often gets asked, when is this really going to happen? And as I said earlier, I don't think the limiting factor is going to be the cost of doing it. And here's the metaphor that I would offer. You can't see this well, I'm sure, but it's, it's a screenshot of iTunes. And why to show this is, that if you think back, what I guess would be 14 years, something like that, um, what was it like? to download music, because you know, they already had, before iTunes, the possibility of downloading MP3 files. And you remember the days when people would go on and use these um, sharing programs that are essentially violations of copyright. But the only way to get stuff is either to rip it off of a CD or to go online. And I think a lot of people um, resorted to criminal activity as a consequence because there, there wasn't really a practical alternative. And I can remember a few early situations where they tried to put in a capability of paying for things and it worked so poorly, eventually gave up. It just wasn't worth the trouble. And this is, I think, what changed that. There were many other examples of the same thing now. Um, but people started using this on a re regular basis because there was a workable system. And I guess I would argue that the day that there is the sort of iTunes of medical records or whatever metaphor you want to use, a clean, fun, user-friendly, effective way to store medical and genomic information, that's the day you're going to see genomics become sort of mainstream in day-to-day -day clinical practice. And I think that's actually going to be more rate-limiting, honestly, than education because I do believe we need to educate health professionals, but I also think that health professionals have adapted to new technologies over the you know, last century or more when they were mature enough and ready enough and when the systems were in place. And I think it's the systems issue that is actually the bigger challenge and not the educational issue. People do figure things out when they're ready to be used. So I'm not arguing against education. It's been a pillar of my career, actually. but. I think we have to put it in its place, and I really believe there's been a lot less attention to systems than there needs to be. All right, I'm going to end with this quote. It's become a little trite now, which may be because it's so good, um, but um, this idea, the best way to predict the future is to invent it. That's what all of you are in the business of doing. I think it's what makes this really the most exciting time, surely in the history of medicine, to be involved in medical research or medical practice, and obviously lots, lots more opportunity for all of us. Thank you.